Okay, I think we're good to go. This is Mike from Iron Beam. We have Dave Lerman here from CME Group, and he's going to talk about how smart money uses micro contracts. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dave Lerman from the CME Group. I'm the director in education. On behalf of the CME Group and myself, I want to thank Iron Beam for hosting this webinar. And uh, we got a lot to cover. Um, it's on micro contracts. And uh, we're going to emphasize micro equities, but we're also going to talk about our other micro contracts because they have been swept up in all the interest that uh, when we launched the micros, uh, we were so successful, it brought attention to, it called attention to our other micro products too that are starting to do very, very well over the last year or two. And we'll talk about that. Quick disclaimer, futures trading and swaps trading and options trading are, are they're not suitable for all investors, okay? They each involve the risk of loss. So be aware of that and do your homework as we always tell people. Um, this uh, little quote here from Warren Buffett, very interesting. Uh, the best investment you can make is an investment in yourself. The more you learn, the more you earn. And uh, in a way that's true, sometimes it's not. I know some very smart people that are horrible traders and I know high school dropouts that are fantastic traders and make a half a million dollars a year. So be careful. Uh, so let's move on here. Uh, why? Woo. Why active traders are trading the micro product suite at the CME group? Uh, we'll go over these uh, rather quickly, but the first is execution costs and liquidity. Uh, they're very, very liquid products. We'll, we'll have uh, some of them up with the order book uh, from CME Direct in a little bit here. Um, but execution costs and liquidity are all terrific. And I have to be determined there. That's a, a typo error that should not be in there, but that's to be determined because I made this slide before we launched the micro equities. We now know that the uh, liquidity is fantastic. It's almost always a one tick market and you can get any, you know, pretty much any size you want to get done. Um, you know, 50 lots, 25 lots, 100 lots. Uh, your typical trader doesn't trade too much more than 100 unless you're, you know, an institution, a pension fund or a hedge fund. So execution costs, pound for pound futures are a real, real good deal. Capital efficiencies, uh, the nice thing about futures, uh, the margin is very small. It's usually three to five, maybe 6% of the notional value of a contract. So with uh, the micro E-mini S&P 500, the margin I believe is $1,100. Uh, so that's that's pretty small. That's good capital efficiency. You control $18,000 worth the notional amount. You only have to put up $1,100. Uh, if you wanted to buy $18,000 worth of stocks, you would have to put up 50% or $9,000. So you, you get to use your capital a little bit more efficiently. And the nice thing about the micro contracts is you could put together um, you know, a nice portfolio of futures contracts. You can be like your own mini CTA, commodity trading advisor. We have around the clock trading. Um, now you could do around the clock trading in ETFs. You could do around the clock trading in uh, the stock market. But the liquidity overnight is just not that good. And unless you're extremely well wired trading ETFs at two or three in the morning, it's going to be really hard to get any order of size done. And our futures markets, you know, they're 24 hour markets. We have a wide, wide uh, customer base over in Europe and we have a wide customer base in the Asia Pacific region. So it's very, uh, very efficient, very liquid, not just in North American time zone, but you know, some of our stuff actually trades more in European and Asia Pacific time zone than it does in the North American time zone. So that's very interesting. Our products are truly international, which is good for someone that wants to trade. Now, most North American traders won't be trading at three in the morning unless you're an insomniac. Um, but you do, you do have um, a wide variety of products and we'll get into them. Strategic reasons. Uh, we'll get into that. There's a, a few things that you can do uh, with uh, futures that you cannot do in the stock market. Or if you try to do them in the stock market or in the ETF market, it would cost you a lot more money. All right. Yeah, pure direct participation in markets and asset classes. I frequently get phone calls, you know, what's the best way to play energy? Should I buy Exxon Mobil stock? Should I buy Schlumberger? Should I buy Valero Energy, a big refiner? And it's like, you can, but you won't get, you know, it's not a direct participation. It's not a direct play on the asset class. If you really want to deal and participate in the energy markets, the best way to do it is the energy market, the crude oil market, the Brent oil market. Uh, because if uh, you have a dollar a barrel move in crude oil, you'll make a dollar times a thousand barrels on uh, the larger WTI crude oil contract. Um, ExxonMobil may actually go down. I mean, today crude oil went down, ExxonMobil went up. They don't always go point for point. ExxonMobil is a very large integrated oil company. 
It has a chemical division, it has refineries, it has gas stations, it's uh, upstream, downstream. It's not gonna be affected on a day-to-day, -day, uh, the price of oil, like crude oil would be crude oil. If it goes up a dollar, you make a dollar a barrel per, uh, per contract. Yeah, full offset with the E-minis. Uh, this is pretty much all the micro E-minis too, the currencies, the, the metals and things like that. Um, they have they have offset. So if you have one E-mini S&P 500 long and you're short 10 micro E-minis and you were to notify your FCM, your brokerage firm, in this case, Iron Beam, um, you, would, um, you would have an offset. They would offset the, so your risk and the position risk would be, would be zero. You can use those contracts to offset each other. And you'll see later on why that could come in handy. Uh, we have the clearinghouse, the clearinghouse margining system. It forces risk management. People are always paying lip service to risk. People are saying, yeah, you let your profits run, you do this, use your stop loss orders and all that. Most people, what separates some of the successful traders from the less successful traders are, is risk management. There's not a lot of people paying attention to risk management. The nice thing about the futures market is if you don't pay attention to risk management, it will be forced upon you and it will be forced upon you by the clearinghouse or your FCM, all right? So it forces risk management either by margins or by variation margins or raising margins or lowering margins. So they, they are very good at risk mitigation, which makes sense. If you look at Bitcoin, uh, the margin's $55,000 a contract. That's, <laughs> if it's a $200,000 contract basically, and uh, it has a $55,000 margin. Uh, there are very few futures contracts that have margins that are that large. So very, very interesting, and it's because of the risk. Uh, the, the volatility in uh, Bitcoin is probably running at about 150% now, which is you know seven times the US stock market. Uh, you can more precisely scale in or out of positions to fine tune exposure. We'll have an example of that later, but uh, one of the things that professional traders use, they get in, then they get in a little bit more, then they get in a little bit more and they scaled in and they'll do the same thing. They'll scale out. If the market rises, they can get out of some of their contracts and it rises some more, they can get you know the remaining balance if you want. Well, doing a smaller contract, especially for a novice trader, allows them to precisely scale in or scale out and uh, do what some professionals do. Uh, one of the biggest reasons um, that people come on over from, uh, ah, from the stock market over to the futures market is tax considerations. Uh, if you look, and we'll have an example of this later too, but if you, look at the, if you look at the taxation of a futures contract versus the taxation of profits on an ETF or a stock, big difference. Um, the futures are taxed according to section 1256 of the Internal Revenue Code, which forget that, just it's a 60-40 rule. 60% 60 of your gain is taxed at long-term capital gains rate, 40% is ordinary income. Whereas if you have a short-term gain in an ETF, you're gonna be taxed at your uh, ordinary income, which is your tax bracket. So we'll have a, a very good elucidation of this with someone in the 32% tax bracket a little bit later on. All the technical indicators that you're, that you're aware of, um, they can be used, that, that are used for stocks and ETFs that are applicable to the futures market. As a matter of fact, the futures markets are so much larger than the ETF market, many technical support, resistance, relative strength, all those things are based off the futures because the amount of futures versus ETFs and versus stocks, it's not even close. Uh, the other reason, Last one, this is important because, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of businesses that haven't been around for a long time and, you know, you wonder. But uh, CME Group, we've been in business, you know, for about 180 years. Uh, the Clearinghouse has been around for a while. The Merck's been around for a while. The Board of Trade was around for even a longer while. And we're all uh, under one roof now. Uh, as I said, we you can diversify uh, the, uh, amongst the micros. Um, it totally meets the needs of an active trader or hedger. We have three different asset classes, equities, currencies, and metals, and we have 14 micro contracts spanning these three different asset classes. So uh, you'll, you'll see the list down there and you'll see it again when we look at the contract specs. Um, uh, we have you know four micro E-minis, we have seven or eight uh, micro FX, and we have uh, three of the micro metals contracts. So that's, that's uh, three big asset classes and uh, Going forward, it'll be very interesting what's going to happen in the currency market with all this money printing and all this stimulus. You see Bitcoin having a huge rally. What does it mean for the dollar? Is there Are people afraid that the dollar, there's a couple of very well-known people on Wall Street that have predicted that the dollar could you know, go down as much as 20, 30% in the next year or two. 
Well, one of the ways to participate in that is with the micro FX, right? The stock market is always an interesting place to be and a great place to, to participate is with the micro E minis and the micro metals. Well, gold's had a great move up and down. It's been churning a little bit lately. Silver's had a wonderful move. So if you don't want to buy the full size, full size contracts, you can do the micro contracts. All right, so let's uh, focus for right for a minute here. Let's focus on the uh, micro re minis. You can see 512 million contracts have been traded in total. This is as of a couple of weeks ago. Average daily volume 1.4 million uh, since the launch in May of 2019. Single record volume, single day record volume 4.16 million. Over 27% uh, trade in the extended trading hour, electronic trading hour session before the cash. So um, our normal trading hours, it's about 72%, 73% of our business, 27% is traded overseas, okay, whether it be Europe or Asia. 30% comes from outside the US, uh, and we have had trades submitted from 180 countries. Remember, this thing's barely a year and a half old, and we have trading in almost every country in the world. There's only 210 countries in the world, so it's pretty amazing the widespread adoption of the micro e-minis. Uh, options average daily volume, again, a very, very good successful launch. By the way, the uh, micro e-mini was the most successful launch in the history of the Merck. Uh, no one's refuted that. And we know it's the most successful in the history of the Merck. Uh, uh, I think it's the most successful of any exchange anywhere in the world. And if someone knows something that was more successful, it traded more than 400,000 on their first day, please call me or email me. But options ADV is 7,400 contracts basically, which is excellent. And options open interest is 28,000. And that is sure to grow because the market's moving. All right, so some of the other um, micro contracts, I wanted to give you some perspective here in terms of where the volumes are and where the volumes aren't at this point. Remember now, they're just getting going. Um, the micros on other products have been a lot around for a couple of years. For the uh, micro e-minis, though, they've only been around since May of 2019. So you can see average daily volume for the micro e-mini S&P is 911,000. Not too far behind the NASDAQ, 702,000. The Dow, 129,000. And the Russell, 93,000. Now, I look for the Russell to really catch fire because small cap stocks have caught fire lately. And there's all sorts of interesting trades that people are doing. But the micro FX, decidedly less volume. It's just a little bit different user base and things like that. But those will grow too if the dollar ever gets volatile. The problem is the volatile, the dollar hasn't been very volatile. Volatility is in some markets, but not all markets. So, but the Euro and the Aussie dollar lead with 23,000 and 11,700 respectively. There's a couple there. The Swiss franc only does a couple hundred a day. The rupee does, you know, a hundred a day. Over to the micro metals and the e-mini crude. Now, the e-mini crude is not a micro, but it's it's a small, its notional value is about the same as most of the micros. So that's why I included it, even though it's named the mini. It's half the size of the regular WTI contract that we trade here. But micro golds <laughs> has soared, volumes up hundreds of percents. It trades 87,000 a day as of November of 2020. That's incredible. And it just goes to show what's going on in the metals market. Silver, 9,296. Nothing in the palladium, which is really strange because palladium's had some moves of 100 or $200 a day. It's just, you know, it's a, it's an industrial metal. It's used for catalytic converters, much more than platinum is now. Now, because palladium is so expensive, things could go back to platinum. You never know. And then platinum would rally back, perhaps. And the E-mini WTI crew does about 28000 a day. So, again, incredible volumes here. Okay. This is an interesting chart. Um, uh, it's from a CME front end system. It's a CME direct. It's basically a way to trade um, all our products. It's a front end, just like, you know, Bloomberg has a front end. Uh, some other firms have front ends and stuff like that. Goldman Sachs has ReadyBook, I believe. Um, this is the Merck's front end. And this is how it would display some of the micros. I put up almost as many of the micros as I could. And I took a snapshot. This is just a print screen from today at about 11 o'clock in the morning. You can see I put Bitcoin up first. Uh, so call your attention though to the uh, item in uh, the, the red outline rectangle, MES. You can see it, that's the micro e-mini S&P 500, MES, uh, the product micro e-mini S&P 500 future, the description March, 2021, that's the March expiration of this year, the new year. Happy new year, by the way. 
And then the next thing you see is the quantity, 43, and then you have the bid and the offer, and then you have the quantity on the offer. So you have the, quant the first quantity, 43, that's how much is on the bid side. So the bid is 37.99.50, 43 contracts. The offer is 37.99.75, 57 are on the offer. So the market is a half by three quarters, 43 by 57. So if you want to do a 10 lot, no problem. You want to do a 50 lot, you might move it a tick on the bid size. If you want to sell a 50 lot, you, or if you want to buy a 50 lot, there's 57 there. There'll be seven left over. And that order book is constantly, you know, replenishing itself. And that's a one tick market, uh, 0 0.50, 0 0.75. The micros move in 0 0.25 increments. They move in quarter increments. Next on down is the NASDAQ 100. You could see 966.75, The minimum tick is 0 0.50, 50 cents. So that's trading at the minimum tick. The Russell is at uh, 2111, 10, 2111, 20. So it's a one tick market. Uh, the gold is um, 5690 to 57, one tick market. Silver is 53 to 55 two tick market and all, so on down. You can see all the currencies, the Euro, the Japanese yen are all one tick market. So there's very good liquidity uh, amongst all the asset classes in the micro complex. Sometimes I hit this thing too fast and uh, it goes way ahead of itself. All right, so let's compare now. We talked about ETFs a little bit. Um, let's talk about trading futures versus ETFs and just do a little comparison here. By the way, I'm not knocking any product. Uh, I think ETFs are a wonderful, wonderful product. A long, long, long time ago, I wrote a book on both the E-minis and the ETFs, and they both have great advantages and almost no disadvantages. But uh, there are a couple of, uh, when you compare them side by side, uh, futures win. Uh, annual management fees, there's no management fees with futures. Uh, they do have annual management fees with ETFs. Usually they're lower because they're indexed products for the most part, but they're still dramatically higher than uh, a futures contract that doesn't have a fee. Capital efficiencies, uh, you have a low upfront margin, usually less than 5%. The ETF, you'll have to put up regulation T margins, which requires 50% of the purchase price, all right? Tax advantages on short-term gains, 60-40 per IRS for futures. No tax advantages on short-term gains. Around-the-clock trading, yes. Uh, ETFs, you could do around-the-clock trading, but the liquidity is very uh, its very thin. You won't be able to do any size at 3 in the morning, 2 in the morning. You can in futures, all right, in many futures. Uh, pattern day trading rules, there are none in futures. There are with ETFs and stocks. And tracking error, futures track cash very, very closely. Um, some ETFs, there's considerable tracking error. Uh, in the early days, the emerging markets ETF relative to the emerging markets cash index uh, mistracked by sometimes one or 200 basis points. That's a lot. That's a lot. Uh, with with uh, the S&P futures, the micro, the E-mini, uh, the correlation is about 99.5%. It's a real close correlation. All right, just a couple things, uh, other additional things on uh, futures versus ETF flows. Um, very simple, this just compares the primary futures contract with the primary ETF. So the E-mini S&P 500 is a primary futures contract for the S&P 500. The SPY is the primary ETF for the S&P 500. That's the S&P depository receipts, uh, the ticker symbols SPY, also known as spiders. So the average daily volume, by the way, this is data ending year, end, year ending 2019, and I hope to get an update year ending 2020 as soon as I can get to my Bloomberg terminal, but since I'm working from home, I cannot get to my Bloomberg terminal. But the average daily volume and notional amount for the S&P 500 futures is 228 billion. For the SPY, it's about 20 billion. So there's 11 times the of volume goes into dollar volume, goes into futures than ETS. Um, the most interesting statistic I like to quote is the next one, uh, the mini S&P 500 versus all 7,000 ETFs around the world, 228 billion in the futures, the E-mini, versus 95 billion for the ETF average daily dollar volume. So you have one futures contract, the mini, launched in 1997, it's 24 years old basically, 
And it outtrades all 7,000 ETFs around the globe. So 228 billion and 95 billion, it outtrades it by 2.4 times. And you know, this, these are the comparisons in the equity markets. If you just look at the 10-year treasury note, it gets worse. Uh, the 10-year treasury note does 178 billion a day. It's one of the most liquid futures contracts in the world, along with Euro dollars and uh, some of our other treasuries, 178 billion to 0.51 billion. 349 times. So you could see gold, the euro, everything, you know, 47 billion to 1 billion. The euro, 29 billion to 0.02 billion. Copper, it's it's crazy. So um, futures and ETFs are both wonderful products, but when it comes to the dollar flows into the product, the futures win by a long shot, a very, very long shot. All right, so here's the contract specs. We are not gonna go over every detail on it. We're only gonna look at one or two of them. You can do your homework and you can look at them later on. They're all on our website too. Uh, all the margins are as of December 29th and subject to change. So we'll just look at the micro E-mini S&P 500. And by the way, uh, the PowerPoint for this, uh, I believe we've sent it to Iron Beam. If not, we shall. And they have permission to distribute to anyone that asks, um, as long as it's uh, in a PDF format. Um, so the ticker symbol MES, it's just like ES, but with an M in front of it for micro. Uh, the contract unit is five times the S&P 500. So it's one tenth of the E-mini S&P. The E-mini S&P is a $50 multiplier. The micro E-mini is a $5 multiplier. So the initial marginal requirement is $1,100. The contract notional value is $18,500. That's just taken, you get that by um, taking 3,700, the value of the S&P a couple, about a week ago, by five, and it comes out to 18,500. So the total notional value of the contract is 18,500. I was talking to Mike before the seminar, you know, this webinar began, and I was saying, even if the S&P went to zero, which it's never done in its, you know, history, if it went to zero, the most you would lose would be 18,500, which is less than the value of a Honda Civic. Uh, now, granted, the clearinghouse, your firm, would uh, you would be out of the trade long before the S&P made it down to zero. And uh, I think during the depression in the 1930s, the the market went down 78 percent. So uh, I don't I don't see that happening anytime soon. And you'd be out long before that, I would hope. If not, the clearinghouse would get you out. Uh, the minimum price fluctuation is a quarter, as we said. The contract months are basically the first five quarterly months, so March, June, September, December, and then March of 2021, 2022, excuse me. Trading hours, we start at five o'clock on Sunday afternoon and we go till Friday at uh, four o'clock. So we basically, you know, there's a little bit of a trading hall from 3.15 to, oops, um, from 3.15 to, this thing's in the way here. Excuse me, hold on a second, folks. <laughs> get this out of here. Ah, shoot, we don't want to do that. All right, so it's 3.50. There's a trading hall from 3.15 basically till, till uh, 4, I think. So it's a 45-minute trading hall. All right, here's some of the micro metals, uh, micro gold, micro silver, and the E-mini crude I put in here too. Initial, uh, it's 10 troy ounces. Uh, GC is the ticker for the regular gold contract. MGC for micro gold is the ticker for the micro gold contract. It's 10 troy ounces. It's one tenth the value of our regular gold contract, which is a hundred ounce contract. The initial margin requirement, a thousand dollars. And the contract notional value of this happens to be about $18,900 as well. So it's very close to the micro S&P 500. Uh, the minimum price fluctuation is just like just like uh, the regular gold contract, but remember everything's one tenth of a, of a, of a one tenth of the amount. So, uh, contract months, monthly contracts listed for three consecutive months in any January, March, May, July. You, you can all read that. We're not going to go over all these details. The trading hours are pretty much the same as the equities. All right, and the margins are as of December 29th. All right. And also, like I said, we're not going to go over all this in detail. These are the micro FX contract specs. They have some strange tickers, M6E, because 6E is the ticker for the Euro FX, the Euro US dollar FX, not the Euro dollar interest rate contract, but the Euro US dollar FX. We call it the Euro. Anyone that's traveled to Europe knows what we're talking about. 
So uh, the contract unit is a euro. Uh, the initial margin is 230. The contract value is 12,500 euros. And the minimum price fluctuation is one pip or one tick, 0. 0.0001, which would equal $1.25. And it's quarterly contracts, March, June, September, and December, same hours as everything else. You can see the, the, the margins are much, much lower than the equities or the metals. And the reason why is volatility. The dollar's been going down, but it hasn't been going down fast. The currency markets are the one market. They saw a little bit of volatility during the pandemic, but most of the volatility was in um, the stock market, the energy markets, and some of the metals markets. Uh, the currencies did not have as much volatility. As a result, the margin requirements are much, much smaller because the currencies aren't moving that much. They've been drifting downward. And so if you've been short the dollar, you've done well, but uh, you haven't had a lot of volatility either. All right, here we go. Here's the potential tax advantages we talked about. And we have two sides there to the trade. We have a futures trade and we have an ETF or equities trade. So we have, um, we're gonna just, this, this will show you with the 60-40 treatment, how important this is. So. You have a short-term profit, all right? We're gonna assume the 32% tax bracket and one trader trades the E-mini NASDAQ 100. This could be the micro two, it doesn't matter. It could be the, the standard size, con it could be any futures contract, but we're just using E-mini NASDAQ here. So let's say you made $10,000 over the course of a week or two. Compare that with uh, trading the QQQ, the ETF that tracks the NASDAQ 100, or making $10,000 short-term profit in Facebook. Again, assuming the 32% tax bracket. Trader A is taxed according to the 60-40 rule. So 60% of the gain is taxed at long-term capital gains rate of 15%. And again, if you make a certain amount, long-term capital gains is up at 20%. 40% is taxed at ordinary income of 32%. So, the blended rate is about 21.8%. On the ETF or equity side, trader B is taxed at ordinary income. He will be taxed the whole thing, 32%. So tra whoops, ooh, trader A owes $2,180 to the IRS and keeps 78.20. Trader B owes 3,200 into the IRS and gets to keep the rest, 6,800. So that's a, a $1,000 difference. And one time in front, a live seminar in front of human beings, living, breathing, you know, when we used to do those things, someone said, okay, big deal. And I said, well, are you a good trader? And the guy kind of like shrugged his shoulders. <laughs> but um, if you're a good trader and you're trading and churning your account and, and, you know, just constantly trading, this adds up. You know, if you make a hundred grand uh, a year trading or 200 grand a year, like some traders I know, or 300 grand, um, I know a couple of people that make a half a million dollars a year, but you know, they're professionals, they know what they're doing. Um, this is a huge amount of money paying 21.8% versus 32%. Do the math. If you're making a hundred grand a year, it's, you know, that's, that's an appreciable amount of money. It's gonna be, you know, $10,000 at least. Uh, so be careful. Um, the taxes are important. It's not what you make, but it's what you take home. All right. So how does smart money use micro and mini size contracts? Let's actually take a look at some of things. Um, let's look at some of these things and uh, see what people are doing. All right. And we'll go over some of them quickly and some of them less quickly. Um, so Scaling in, we already talked about this a little bit. Let's get into the details of it. So individual traders are using micro futures to scale in and out of positions, all right? One and two lot E-mini traders can now trade, you know, 10, 15, or 20 micro contracts and scale in and out of the market. For example, an E-mini trader sells one contract at 37.60 and covers at 37.47, all right? So if an E-mini trader does that, and he does one E-mini and he sells one contract at 37.60 and buys to cover at 37.47, he's made a profit and there's nothing wrong with that. He's made, you know, 13 points and uh, that's it. He's in the trade, he's out of the trade because he's a one lot trader and there's nothing wrong with that. He made a profit. Uh, I just remember this in my early trading days. If you buy a one lot and you get in it, you get out at a profit, that's it. You have no recourse. You're not in the market if the market were to keep going up if you were long. Well, what if the trader executed 10 micros instead? 
They could have covered five lots down at 3747. They could have bought back another two or at least all right. So they can they cover five lots at 3747 and they can leave five contracts to run and cover lower prices and make more profit. So you could buy back two, you know, down at a lower price, and then you can buy back maybe the th three remaining contracts. You let them run for even more profit. And uh, so you would just, you have a much better opportunity by scaling in or scaling out. You have an opportunity to catch a larger move as, to pose, as opposed to, you know, doing a one lot and being in and then being out. All right, makes sense? So that's the primary thing people are, one of the primary things people are doing. It allows them to be a little bit more precision in their trading instead of buy one, get out of one or sell short one and cover one. Now you can do five or 10 and scale in and scale out. You know, you could scale in with two or three, as little as two or three contracts. So, uh, but you know, the, e, even the E-mini S&P 500, the notion of value is getting so large. It's, you know, $180,000. So it's a big contract and the margin's $12,000. And that's a bit much for certain people. So the micros are a very unique uh, instrument and perfect for a new trader and novice trader. All right, so one of the other things you can do is, uh, we talked about uh, strategic things that you can do, spreading, spreading with micros and margin efficiencies. Now, we because we're limited on time, I, I, don't, I wanna cover as much as I can, as much material as I can, but we have a lot of data on this page. The only thing I really care about is towards the bottom. And I think I just, you know, I didn't, I didn't do it on this thing, but I wanna focus your attention that there's, you know, 20 years of data here that show the Russell performance, the Russell 2000, Russell 2000 measures small cap performance. Uh, the S&P 500 obviously is large cap performance. And this goes back to the year 2001. It shows the Russell performance, the S&P, the Russell minus the S&P, which one outperformed. And uh, over the long run, small cap stocks outperform large caps. Over the long run, over the last 75 to 90 years, you would have done slightly better with small cap stocks than you would have large caps. They're, they grow a little bit faster. They're more nimble. Um, and they're just, they're more risky too, though. They have a larger standard deviation, a larger volatility. But over the last few years, that's changed. The last six months notwithstanding, the last five years, it's been really, really rough on small cap stocks. So I call your attention to, let's go down to uh, the uh, the very end of 2017, 12, 29, 2017. You're near almost the bottom of the chart or nearing the bottom of the chart. The uh, small caps were up 12.64, large caps were up 18.87. So large caps outperformed by 623 basis points or small caps underperformed by 6.23%. Then look a few months later in July of 2018, the Russell, 10.50, um, the S&P 500, 4.0. So now the Russell's flip, it's outperformed by 5.7 percentage points. Uh, reason why? Well, what happened in July? What happened in the summer 2018? Trade and tariff wars. Uh, they tend to affect, the trade and tariff wars affect large multinational corporations more. Caterpillar, John Deere, General Motors, IBM, they're gonna be more negatively impacted by the trade and tariff issues with China, China than um, small caps are. So small caps came back, uh, but by the end of the year, look what happened. By the end of 2018, small caps down 12.17, large caps down only 6.24. Whoa, Dave, what happened? Well, we had a really nasty bear market in the last uh, quarter of 2018. Um, <laughs> and in a nasty bear market, small cap stocks are gonna get hit more than large cap stocks. One, they're not as, uh, they don't have the balance sheet. They don't have their, they're riskier. So any down market is gonna exacerbate their movement. Uh, so they underperform by 593 basis points. Then by the end of 2019, uh, again, we had a you know very nice rally in 2019. And again, in a spirited rally, you should see small caps outperform, but they didn't this time. So that's one of the more legit, you know, 587 basis point underperformance. But then comes the pandemic and look what happened in uh, April, April of 2020, we were down 36.9%, the S&P down only 22.9%. Uh, again, uh, in a pandemic, large cap multinational corporations are much stronger, their balance sheets are much stronger, they're gonna outperform and boy, they outperformed big time. 
uh, 13.98 percentage points. That's one of the largest I've ever seen in underperformance for the Russell. Usually that kind of number you'd see outperformance in the Russell, but not now. Uh, by June of 2020, uh, we're well into the pandemic. We're still underperforming the Russell by, it's underperforming by almost 11 percentage points. But then look what happened. Sometime in July, August, things started to turn. And then in November, small caps had their biggest rally in history. They were up 18% in November alone. So, and by the end of the year in December, they also rallied dramatically by December 25th, right before Christmas, small caps up 20%. S&P 500 large caps up only 14.6. Finally, flipping the perf abysmal performance of small caps. And to this day, uh, on the first 10 days of January, uh, the Russell has done really, really, really well. It's had some very spirited rallies. And this, this had to happen. You can't have small caps underperform for this long a period of time. So anyway, this is some of the things you can do with the micros. You can get, you could take advantage of this. If you thought that the Russell was finally going to come back, you can get long Russell futures and short the S&P 500 futures. Or if you thought the S&P 500 was going to outperform, you can get long the S&P 500 and short the Russell. All right. You also get margin offsets. Uh, I want to call your attention to the very top line here. If your outlook with small caps outperform large caps, you get long the Russell 2000, short the S&P 500. And you can do this with micros too. Doesn't matter, minis or micros, the margin would be a lot less for the micros. And there's certain ratios that the clearinghouse recognizes, all right? There's certain ratios, you know, you do it two to one because of the notional value. You would do two Russells, two long two Russells, versus short one S&P 500. And if you do it in the correct ratio, according to the clearinghouse, you get an 80% margin offset. That means you're only gonna have to pay 20% of the gross margin of the two individual positions. And I think I have an example of that. Yes, here I do. So let's look at the trade uh, in detail. Uh, so you have a micro e mini Russell, you're gonna be long one of those, let's say, okay. So 600, uh, the margin $600 times two. So the margin's 1200. The micro e mini leg, you'll be short one of those. So it's $1,100 times one contract or 1100. The uh, total position gross, total, total gross margin is $2,300. Well, you don't have to pay 2300 because both futures contracts trade at the CME group, the CME clearinghouse has recourse. Um, so the margin offset is 80%. You'd only have to put up $460, the cost of a fine meal in the city of Chicago. Cost of one meal at French Laundry up in Northern California, which we all know about now. Uh, anyways, no political commentary allowed, but uh, so this is an example of some of the things that you can do with futures. You could do this with ETFs, but the margins will eat you up. There's be just be a very, very large, um, the regulation T margins will require you putting up 50%. So, and you're doing two legs here, so there's no margin offset. And you don't have the great 24 hour trading that you do with futures. All right, let's move on with some of the other things. All right, so you can also do spreading with gold and silver. I'm not going to get into you know too much of the detail on this one. I want to leave time for Q&A, and we still have more material to cover. But one strategy that's captured the attention of traders, large and small, is the gold-silver spread, otherwise known as the gold-silver ratio. During the March-April timeframe, the ratio hit 125. All right, for those of you that watch this thing, you know what I'm talking about. For those of you that don't watch it, 125 is ridiculous. That, <laughs> um, just in my opinion, not the Mercs, but it made silver so cheap relative to gold. Uh, I think it was historically the cheapest that silver has ever been relative to, to its gold counterpart. So it's just, it's the number of ounces of silver required to buy one ounce of gold. So you just simply divide the price one by the other. And it usually 90 is, it's pretty high. Uh, gold silver ratio of 90 is pretty high. Well, during the initial pandemic time frame, this thing spiked up to 125. It was insane. So uh, now with gold trading currently at 1905 an ounce, this is a couple days ago, and silver at 2472 an ounce, the ratio is currently at 77. Obviously, silver has gained relative to gold. And could you have traded on this? Could you have participated in this? Yes. So here's a chart. And you can see this one in the top upper left, you can see this is GCA, this is gold versus silver, SI. 
and this is off of a, um, we took the data from Bloomberg, but you can see the market goes all the way up to 125 there in March or April of 2020. And then uh, silver started going up three, four percent a day, and gold would only go up one or two percent a day. You do that over enough days, and this gold silver ratio collapses. And down in the lower right, I have a very long term chart that goes back to 1987. You can see on the low side, it's 50. On the high side, it's around, you know, 85, 90, 95. And we dropped all the way down to like 70, and it's currently at 77. So, could, how could you have made money? Same way. This is a, um, you, you'd get long silver and you could do it with micros and short micro gold. And I have the prices there in uh, October of 2020. And then I have the prices in December um, when I was actually, you know, doing this trade and talking about it over the summer that this, this thing's got to move. And a couple of commodity bulls that I know that do very, very well trading commodities and our big spread traders said, silver has got to move. Silver has just got to move. Well, it moved. Um, it moved a lot. So, uh, but the, if you did this trade long micro silver and short micro gold during this time frame, you actually made money on both sides of the spread, which almost never happens. <laughs> Usually what your hope is you make more money on one side of the trade and it offsets the losses of the other side of the trade completely and you still have a profit. In this case, you made $2,100. In the margin, well, remember now, the uh, gold and silver have been moving around a lot, especially silver. So the margins you know, are, are much higher than you'd imagine. Uh, for the micro contract. So the total gross margins, $3,800. The uh, margin offset, it's only 60%. So you'll have to pay $1,520. That's probably dinner for five or six people at a very nice restaurant. But still, that's pretty good to, to do a spread of this magnitude for $1,500 is a very fair margin, all right? And the margin offsets, um, and the reason why it's only a 60% gross margin offset or margin offset is because Silver has been really volatile relative to gold. So the clearinghouse has to assign a little bit of a different margin than they normally will because it's risk mitigation. And that's what the exchange and the FCM community is into, risk mitigation. Above all, they wanna make sure that you know, you're protected from volatility to the extent that we can protect you. But uh, the margins, uh, people that don't pay attention to risk management, your brokerage firm or the clearinghouse do pay attention to it, all right? All right. How wealth managers use micro e mini. So um, I wanna get to some of the other stuff we're gonna do, but we'll talk about this. I, I'm not gonna go over everything on this example, but suffice it to say that um, a trader can use, you can use the micros to speculate. They're wonderful speculative tools, whether it be spreading or whether it be, um, you know, just doing short-term trading and stuff like that. Um, they're, they're wonderful instruments, but they also can be used as hedgers. There's a hedges, hedges. You can use them as a hedge vehicle. So what you can do if you have a portfolio of ETFs or a portfolio of mutual funds or a portfolio of stocks, you can use uh, the micros as um, a hedge. So I got a quick example here. Again, we're not gonna go through every page, but uh, let's just say we got an RIA, Registered Investment Advisor. He uses ETFs as well as futures and options to help his, his clients out. Uh, this call, by the way, it's a case study. It came uh, in February, right before the pandemic. Remember, the market was at all time highs at 3,600 before it was about ready to drop 35% in three weeks. Um, client's account reached about 400,000 over the past few years, up from a quarter million, uh, and that's comprised of ETFs. So they got 1,000 shares of the SPY, about 400 shares of the IWM, which is the iShares Russell 2000 ETF. So those are 350,000. 50,000 in cash, it's got $400,000, all right? Uh, clients got some anxiety about the, their holdings and wonders about protecting the portfolio and from a declining market. Client is in the early 60s and nearing retirement. So imagine you're facing a bear market possibly and a couple of months later, that's exactly what this turned into. Um, you're in your 60s, you're gonna start drawing down your money and at the same time, a terrible bear market hits. This is what's called sequence of returns risk. In other words, sequence of returns is when you go into retirement and uh, it's, it's the risk of a declining market as one starts to draw down their account in retirement and early retirement. And the combination, the one, two combination is devastating. It could really chop off the number of years that your money will last. So this is an interesting hedge example. You can hedge using micros. So, 
calculating and implementing the hedge real quickly, you have 300,000 in long SPY exposure, all right? Well, each micro E-mini, remember now, uh, the notional values are 15,000 in this example because this was back in February of last year. Uh, the S&P 500 is at 3,800 now, but back then it was 15,000. So 300,000 divided by 15,000 per contract, you would need 20 contracts to hedge your large cap exposure or your ETF exposure. So the advisor would need to sell 20 MES contracts to hedge your, um, your SPY exposure, okay? Then you have to calculate the, uh, the IWM exposure and how to hedge that. Well, 50,000 in long IWM, each micro back then was worth 68.25. So 50,000 divided by 6,825, and you got 7.3 contracts. So now you know your hedge ratios. You have to hedge with 20 uh, micro S&Ps and roughly seven micro E-mini Russells. Here's the margin, 20 contracts. At the time, the margin was $1,200 a contract. Seven IWM hedges or seven, you know, micro E-mini Russell would be 640 per contract. $28,000 to hedge this portfolio or about 7.12% of the, the portfolio, all right? So you can see these are very useful for speculating, for, for precision hedging, or excuse me, precision uh, trading. Uh, you can do spreads, you can do hedges, you can do options trades now because we have options on the micro. So they're very, very, very versatile instruments. All right, I am going to, we have about 14 minutes left. I'm gonna cover a few more things and then we'll take some questions, but I'm gonna have to go through quickly here. By the way, here's the sequence of return risk. You can get it on this page if you keep scrolling. It shows Mr. Bull, Mr. Bear, and it shows what happens when you have a nasty bear market right as you're entering into retirement. You can see the money runs out much, much faster. Instead of lasting till age 90, it runs out at like age 82, 83. So uh, to pay attention to that, uh, futures contracts are for more than speculation. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of gigantic hedgers in the market, and that's what the market's for. It's to, for people to take on risk and some people to offset risk, all right? All right, so what's coming up in the next couple of uh, months or what's, what, what have we launched recently and what's coming up? Well, we launched Bitcoin futures, as you know, and we... Um, We've had great success. I think average daily volume is around 10,000 contracts, which given that it's a $55,000 margin and the volatility of it, that's pretty darn good for something that's been around for only a couple of years. But in February, um, on the heels of the success of Bitcoin, we're going to launch Ether Futures, which is based on the Ethereum blockchain and has also done very well. You know, Bitcoin's gone from, you know, 20,000 to 41,000 in the last couple of weeks. Uh, Ethereum has gone from basically five or 600 all the way up to about 1200. I think it's comfortably at just under 1100 now. I haven't looked, but something that you want to consider for those cryptocurrency uh, traders out there. Well, we're now going to have our second uh, addition to our, our product suite. Here's contract specs. It'll be 50 coins, 50 ether. So it's roughly $55,000 contract size now, okay? It's coming February 8th, subject to regulatory approval. You'll see all the contract specs there. We're not gonna get into all the details, but uh, it should be very, very interesting, especially if you look at the, <laughs> the, the next chart. Uh, here's a barchart.com uh, chart that showed, you know, Ethereum back in, uh, Mid-December was trading at 600, and it shot up in a couple of days to almost 1,200. It actually went higher than that. But at that notion, at that price, it would be 1,043 times 50 Ether per futures contract, or about 52,150. So we'll have a good contract at a pretty decent size, 52,000. No wallets required, no worrying about losing wallets or passwords. Uh, the story broke today about a guy that was paid in Bitcoin many, many years ago. Uh, he was paid in 7,000 Bitcoin. It was only worth like 50 cents though at the time. Well, now that 7,000 Bitcoin is worth about $220 million. But the guy forgot the password to open up his wallet. And he's only got 10 chances at a guess. He's used eight of them. So he's trying to figure out a way before he exhausts his other two choices, how to get into the darn wallet, private key, public key, all that stuff, all the security. And it's very interesting. I feel for the guy, but it's also very interesting. And one of the nice things about trading futures on Bitcoin or Ether, no wallet. All you need is a brokerage account. 
And um, that's it. So February 28th, uh, look for more information. We'll have updates on our website. Don't know what the margins are going to be. My guess is they're going to be they're going to be high because the volatility of Ether is pretty much the same volatility as Bitcoin, maybe not as high, but it will be very high. This will be a lot more than the three to five percent you see in stock indexes or currencies or something like that, only because it's cryptocurrency. Now, one thing we did launch uh, for people that are into the environment and into uh, you know agricultural markets, we launched a couple of uh, about a month or so ago, the NASDAQ Vela's California Water Index feature. So we're actually trading water futures. Can you believe it? Water futures. Um, it's a cash settle product. Um, now, I'm just going to get into the generalities here. I'm not going to get into the details, but I want to call your attention to the price chart on the right hand side here. And you can see um, the price of water as it uh, goes up. It usually goes up. It's accompanied by drought. Um, so you can see California PDSI. That's the Palmer Drought Severity Index. So the more brown you see there, that, that lightish brown color underneath the chart, as that gets more and more negative, that means the drought's getting worse and worse and worse. And you know California, this is, this is a California water index. It uh, measures uh, the cost of water amongst like five of the largest uh, traded water markets in California. So California is a huge agricultural concern and the, one of the biggest costs is the cost of water. They just don't have enough rain there, so they have to buy water. And uh, water is a commodity that, you know, here in the Great Lakes area, we got Lake Michigan, we never worry about it. But in California, they worry about it because there's been so much drought. But anytime the drought gets really severe or significant, the price of water goes up. So imagine you're a farmer, like you own a winery or you own, a, you know, a lettuce farm or something like that, like up in Salinas Valley. Uh, the cost of water is going to wipe out your profits if it goes too high. So the nice thing about this thing, uh, yeah, it's basically 325,000 gallons of water. It's a 10 acre foot contract. Uh, so we're getting into the deep end of things here, but an acre foot's the amount of water needed to cover an acre of land by a depth of one foot. Uh, I learned a lot studying this contract. It's really interesting, but the agricultural commercial user, the farmer, municipalities and investors, can all you know trade this thing? Now you can imagine it's 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 not like you know treasury futures that trade three hundred thousand a day. You know that will change though as more and more people get used to it. It's a very very new product, very innovative, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll see growth in the future. You know, euro dollars didn't get to where they were. It took ten years for euro dollars to grow to one hundred thousand contracts a day. Well now they do millions a day. So new markets it takes time and patience. So we are going to be launching ether futures. We've launched water futures. Uh, you know, taking a put an eye on them or you know study them a little bit if you're into that kind of thing. Um, but if uh, you know you have any questions, feel free to talk to your folks at IRBM or call us up here at the CME Group. Uh, there's the contract specs. Uh, again, we're not going to go over them. It's something you can look at on uh, on your own later on. Uh, let's see what's next here. All right, real quick for those new to futures, micro and e-mini futures contracts must be traded from a futures account. Opening an account is not complicated. Many firms allow futures trading, but again, it requires separate futures account documents. There may be a minimum account thresholds and other requirements to trade, and they vary uh, from broker to broker. Shorting micros will be much easier than shorting stocks or ETFs for several reasons, and margin with futures is different than margin with stocks and ETFs. Um, so key takeaways, and then we'll take questions here. Uh, micro contracts can benefit newer traders and those with smaller accounts. Micros have many advantages when compared with ETFs. Micros can be used to hedge ETF portfolios and mutual fund holdings and establish anticipatory hedges. Micros allow newer traders to reduce risk from two viewpoints, margins and dollars. And they have all the great advantages of our larger product suite at one tenth the size or one half the size for the mini crude. Micros can be used by traders, hedgers, and spreaders, and they enjoy around the clock accessibility. And a couple more quotes. Most important quality for an investor, temperament, not intellect. I know brilliant PhDs from MIT that lose their money fast. Um, those with the temperament for the futures market, and you'll learn this in time, it's temperament. A lot of it is temperament. 
Um, it does no good to you know, have a PhD in quantum physics that will give you no advantage in trading futures. Might give you an advantage in trading options because they're very quantitative, but uh, very, very few people you know, with, with you know, that kind of intellectual horsepower do well. Of, co of course though, the one that did the best, um, I forget who ran Renaissance Capital, Richard Simons. He was from MIT, he put his math background to work and got 44% annualized returns over more than a decade. So he, uh, he did pretty darn good. Um, so, and if you're ever having a bad day, remember in 1976, Ronald Wayne sold his 10% stake in Apple for 2,300. It's now worth 70 billion. So that along with the guy that cannot forget the password to open up his private and public keys in uh, his wallet, um, they're kicking themselves a little bit. But anyways, I wanna thank you all for listening in. And I, I invite you to go to the cmegroup.com slash education and the activetrader.cme group part of our site. Contact the people at Ironbeam, certainly email us if you want. And um, that's it, we'll take some questions now. Thanks, Dave. Uh, let's just take them from the top. Let me see here. So the first one's from Jeff. I'm gonna rephrase this question a little bit. Um, is micro crude coming and if so, when? Uh, no plans. They actually bantered it about, they talked about it at the higher levels of the Merck and uh, they figure given the contract size of the mini crude now, um, you know, it's a, it's a $26,000 contract basically, um, or a $20,000, $25,000 contract. That's small enough, they deemed. And right now with the environment and the crude, what, you know, what we went through with negative oil pricing and stuff like that, it's probably best that we just do nothing right now. So, as of now, no plans for a micro crude. The mini crude is pretty darn close to a micro contract though. Okay. Next is what are volumes like on gold, silver, and palladium? All right, believe it or not, I mean the, in the micro contracts? They did not specify. Oh, well, uh, in the micro contracts, gold's doing about 29,000, excuse me, 89,000 a day. Let me go back to that page, hold on. Uh, let's see. Yeah, gold uh, average daily volume up till November was 87,000. Silver was 9,200. And um, palladium hasn't traded. Like I said, that's that's a big surprise to me because palladium has had some gigantic moves. It just doesn't trade a lot. Now the larger contract for gold trades three to four hundred thousand a day. Silver does about a hundred thousand a day, and uh, palladium does about four thousand a day. The big contract. Let's see. Next person asks: With a cash account of fifteen hundred dollars, can you trade the mini S and P or Nasdaq? That would really just depend on how your account's set up for day margins. You obviously wouldn't be able to buy and hold either of those with that kind of balance. You could definitely trade the micros and you could hold them overnight with full margins um, at that account balance. But for the minis, that would really just to come come down to how your account's set up for day trading margins. Um, next yeah, that one. Would be, that'd be, that'd, you'd be a little bit uh, under under capitalized there if you're trading the minis with a $1,500. <laughs> yep. Yeah. That's it's one uh, seems, one twenty point move, and you're done. It seems to be what a lot of people want to do now, but um, in the long term, long run, it's just very hard to be a successful trader, especially in futures with that kind of balance. Micros, you're you have a much better chance, obviously, but minis that be that be pushing it there. Um, next question: When? last year did smart traders start noticing that the gold silver ratio was so out of whack that it was a good opportunity do you know anyone who tried to short the ratio and got hurt i don't know anyone personally that short short the ratio i mean that would be that's you got to be a one heck of a contrarian you know when you're at the way above the outer limits of silver being cheap relative to gold to short that thing um I don't know any trader that I don't I don't to answer the question I don't know any trader that did that I know several I mean we started talking about it right around the pandemic time maybe February I did a trader's edge on it and uh, I think actually 
I don't say what you want about Jim Rogers. He's actually a very good long-term trader and he's good with the metals. But I heard him say in, in March that, you know, silver is probably the better deal. It's really underpriced relative to gold. And I thought, thank you, Jim. And uh, a lot of people signed on and watched uh, the, the Trader's Edge, you know, the short little five minute video we did on it. But um, I don't know anyone that did the opposite side of the trade. Now, maybe now different where you'd get, um, you know, you 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 play the other side because we went down so far so fast from 125 to 77 that it wouldn't surprise me to go back to you know 85 90. Yeah, you'd have to wonder what the rationale would be for exactly. someone to do that. But given silver's made it to fifty dollars an ounce twice in the last 20 years, be careful. <laughs> and it's it's half that now. I mean, yeah. gold had new all-time highs. Silver went, get, didn't get anywhere near its all-time high in 2020. So the next question, will the CME offer either micro Bitcoin or Ethereum after some time goes by? I, I, you know, I'd have to say maybe because if Bitcoin keeps going up, the contract will be so big. Um, you got to be careful, though. The regulators are watching this very, very closely. They don't want an ETF. I mean, they haven't uh, they haven't allowed an ETF yet. They're just afraid that people will get hurt. And we talked about this before this seminar started that, you know, there are people hurt, you know, with biotech stocks and some of these tech stocks that are going up 20 fold in three or four days. It's, it's crazy. There's a lot more risk in that than Bitcoin, I think, or just as much risk. So uh, I think down the road, when we get enough liquidity, we want to build core liquidity. We're still only doing 10,000 Bitcoin a day, which is good. But, um, you know, the Merck considers everything. And if enough people, you know, suggest something, we're usually pretty responsive and would uh, consider it. But we have to be careful of the regulators on this one. And I think it, it probably goes without saying a mini would come first before a micro, correct? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Which micro contracts have the least slippage? The NASDAQ and the e mini S&P. Yeah. They're almost always a one tick market. If, if you're looking for the least slippage, if, if you're talking in terms of number of orders per price level, definitely S&P. Um, yeah. I, I guess that would probably be your best metric to go by, right? Yeah, they have the best top of book depth and they have the best, uh, the depth of order book, like five lower, five best bids, five best offers. Yeah. Okay, someone asked if we're gonna email out today's uh, PowerPoint. I'll, I'll, I'll be sending that out. We're also gonna post a recording of the presentation too. So we'll send out links okay. for that for yep, those who can do that. make it or who want we to. We welcome that. It. Um, will there, the person asked, uh, Chris asked if, if we have any idea if there will be an S and P 400 micro in the near future. Probably not anytime soon. There's just, uh, the S and P mid cap 400, uh, it's mostly an institutional product. You know, speculators have their hands, you know, they're happy with S and P they're happy with NASDAQ. They're happy with Russell. The mid cap is just, um, you know, it's done well. You can't, you know, it's done 25, 30, 40,000 contracts a day. Um, but it, it's used by a handful of institutions that have mid cap exposure in their portfolios, like a pension fund or something like that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not ruling it out, but I have heard no talk of it, no demand. This is the first time someone's brought up a micro mid cap. Yeah. Yeah. He also asked about. S&P 600, but I'm just going to assume that's the same case there. Yeah, we, used, we used to have an S&P 600 that just, it, it, it couldn't compete with the Russell. We launched it when we lost the Russell 2000 contract to ICE, but we got it back. So no need to. Now, let's see here. Do stops on futures ever fail? Uh, it depends how you want to define yeah. fail you can answer that one <laughs> and yeah you can chime in too but if, if your question is does the stop guarantee where you're going to get out uh absolutely not right. because what can happen is if a market's gapping or if there's poor liquidity let's say you're long some we'll just call some x x future from 100 and your stops at 90 and some crazy news hit, hits the market all of a sudden or even worse it, it 
bad news hits when the market's closed during a market pause or something like that. The futures could have closed at 100 and on the reopen, they might open at 70 and your stops at 80. It's going to get triggered immediately on the open, but you're getting out at 70 or worse. Same thing can happen while the market's open if you get really, really bad news and liquidity dries up and prices go crazy. Um, your fill price versus your stop price can be can be way off. Not necessarily something that happens all the time, but it's definitely a very real risk. Yeah, I wouldn't have anything more to add to that. But yeah, the gaps can be killers. Yep. Uh, oh, he he asked after that. Besides, between when the market opens and closes, yeah, I we just covered that, so you should be good there. Let's see here. This is a question for you, Stephen asks. What were the CME's original projections for micro FX volumes compared with current volume levels? <laughs> we were <laughs> we never imagined 400,000 a day. We knew it would be we were pretty convinced that it would be a success, but we have a contest uh before we launch a, a con uh, uh, any contract, we usually have a little contest amongst uh staff members. And uh the most uh radically optimistic choice in that contest was about a hundred thousand contracts um you know after the first couple of months well <laughs> we were doing about four or five hundred thousand contracts after the first few months and now we're doing 1.4 million so no one was even close you would expect that to grow too i mean if at least in my opinion if you're deciding between just trading you know forex versus trading fx futures at cme i would you would hope most people would just trade the futures. Right. Let's see here. For ES and NQ, do you have statistical data showing how profitable traders are trading? For example, how much time they are in a trade, just as an example. Iron Beam doesn't. Uh, Dave, the Merck doesn't you, either. Yeah. <laughs> we have the average size per trade, but I don't know if they release that to the public. But no. It would probably be tough to track too, since futures is, you know, when you're buying, someone else is selling. So it's pretty much all offset, you know? Right. Um, The Jared, who asked about the stops on futures, also asked about options. As far as I know, there are no CME futures or any futures in general that I'm aware of where you the exchange allows a stop order on an option. Do you know anything different from that, Dave? No, John, can you weigh in on that? Do you know? Are you still on? I'm still here. Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Do, do, are you aware of any futures that the CME offers where they actually allow a stop order on an option? No, off the top of my head, I don't. Um, but I can double check and confirm and get back to you. There, there might be some platforms that offer, I guess what we call a synthetic stop, where if the option trades at some price, the platform might put in a market order or something like that. But um, as far as I know, there's no such thing as a stop order on an option for futures. Uh, let's see here. So will you offer micro Forex like Euro versus pound and the second one, I'm not sure. What's CHF? Uh, Swiss franc. Pound versus yeah, franc. Yeah, those are cross rates where the dollar is not a part of the trade. Um, probably not anytime soon, no. Okay. There's just not a lot of liquidity in the cross rates. We have cross rate futures, regular size cross rates, but they don't, they never gathered that much, you know, liquidity, not like our regular currencies. Um, here's a good one. This was in the news a lot a few years ago. Um, do you believe spoofing is still an issue? Um, I don't know. I always... <laughs> I, I, you know, I couldn't answer the question accurately. Uh, I, I, think... I, I always told people that if, you know, you want to, I had this argument once with a guy at a very large money management firm. He said, I can't believe what's going on in the market. You know, people put these orders in and they bid on 5,000 contracts. 
and then they, you know, withdraw the, the, the market. They're just testing the market. And it's like, yeah. well, you know what? one day, one of those guys will get hit on his 5,000 and he won't do it anymore because he's going to own 5,000 contracts if he doesn't withdraw his bid quick enough. Yeah, and that and I know you guys started cracking down on it a while ago. And I know, I, I don't know the specific rules, but I know that you guys have stuff to catch it. And also, I think it's if you modify an order or something like six times without it being filled, it's automatically flagged and looked at or something like that. So I know the system yeah, in were place. To, That's for sure. They were looking yeah. into it, but I don't know what came of it. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Does Iron Man offer most of the comments on our liquidity and our markets are very, very positive. Yeah. You know, when an institution can come in and, you know, do 10,000 treasuries at one clip, they're happy. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, does Iron Beam offer managed accounts to take advantage of some of the hedging strategies you briefed? Um, yes, we work with a number of CTAs and CPOs. Um, if you're curious about those, you can email us. There's a, some, of, some of them on our website. And if you're looking for like an easy managed solution, we also offer something called iSystems, where instead of... Um, you know, signing up with like one money manager, you basically have a login where you can you can choose and pause and play different strategies that are developed by third party developers and you can look at their track history and all that stuff. Um, so that's something to look at if you're not looking to actually create your own account. Um, let's see what else is in here. What are the benefits of trading options on futures versus the outright futures? Limited risk for the long option holder. Uh, a lot more different strategies that you can do. You can make money, you know, in many, many different environments with options versus futures. But there's a trade-off for all those advantages. The trade-off is you have to learn to think in four dimensions. Options are futures. You only have to worry about up and down. With options, you have time to expiration and changes in implied volatility impacting your premiums. So you get all those magnificent strategies, but you better learn to think in four dimensions. Yeah, I agree with that. O options are helpful if, if you have a trade idea and you're very specific about timing, you can design something that would be more successful you know, just trading the options versus the futures market in terms of risk to reward. But there, you know, there's also a give and take with that. And then last question, um, we're gonna wrap up here pretty shortly. So if anyone has anything else, feel free to put it in the chat. I'm about to read the last question here unless a few more come in. Um, what are Iron Beam's current margin requirements for the mini ES and does Iron Beam support iOS? Um, the overnight margins we just use cme's margins you can check those in your trading platform in terms of day margin everything is custom per account um so if you have a live account with us just shoot us an email if you're not sure what your day margins are set to but um every trader is different so we don't treat every trader the same so everyone has different margins and we try to set up accounts the way that um would most benefit the customer and the answer to the second question does iron beam support ios yes we have uh the fire tip x uh mobile trading app is in the app store um and that's i would argue that's probably one of the only couple like fully featured mobile futures trading apps so definitely check that out if you haven't just search fire tip x in the uh, app store and you can sign up for a demo if you don't already have a live account and i'll give you guys like 30 seconds to put any more questions in there. If not, I think we are all done. I think that's it. I think so. You got anything else? No. All right. Well, thanks for coming. Um, we appreciate CME for doing these. I think this is the third or fourth webinar um, we've done with you guys, and you guys are always great. So thanks for that. Thanks for um, everyone coming. I will email out the um, PDF version of this for anyone that's interested. And also we'll email out the link to the recording um, just in case you want to rewatch or if you didn't make it, but um, thanks for coming. Thanks for having us too.